Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Highwood Health Show. This is episode 16, and we're going to talk about ketones, ketosis, ketone esters, salts, and many other fun keto things. If you haven't yet listened to last week's episode, you'll definitely want to go look for that and give it a listen. In it, I was joined by Dr. Rosanne Capana Hodge, who's a clinical psychologist who specializes in stress and anxiety management in children. We spoke about how to recognize anxiety in our little ones and how to seek out help. That was episode 15. On this week's episode, though, I'm joined by Frank Yosa, who's the founder and CEO of a company called Ketone Aid. They manufacture a ketone ester, which helps people get into ketosis and improve their energy, focus, and even athletic performance. Just from my initial exchange with Frank, I am super excited about what he has to share with us in regard to exogenous ketones, the differences between ketone esters and salts, and so much more. I hope you guys are ready for this. This episode is brought to you by our Highwood Health Facebook group. If you haven't yet joined, you can request to do so by going over to dre.show forward slash group and click on the appropriate button. You can also find that link on this episode's description, by the way. I look forward to seeing you there, but now I won't keep you any longer. Welcome to episode 16 with Frank Yosa. And remember, you're on the highway to health and I'm your guide to help you get there. Are you ready to live ageless? Want to discover alternative health choices, cutting edge nutrition and fitness for the entire family? Welcome to Highway to Health Show with your host, Dr. E, the stem cell guy, where Dr. E helps you live ageless. And now here's your host, Dr. E. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Highway to Health Show. As you heard in the introduction, today we're going to be talking about ketones and ketosis. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know that 2019 has been the year of the ketone diet. Tons of celebrities are endorsing it. Every dietitian, coach, and doctor is being asked about it. And almost everyone is trying to lose weight on a ketogenic diet. But contrary to what you may know, ketogenic diets have been around for many, many, many years and used to treat several neurologic disorders, such as epilepsy. We know that it helps patients with autism and Alzheimer, among many others. So for today's episode, I wanted to bring in someone who's much more knowledgeable about ketones and ketosis than I am. This man dedicates his entire time studying it, and as you will soon find out, he knows a thing or two about it. His name is Frank Josa, and he's the founder and CEO of Ketonade, which specializes in making an exogenous ketone ester. Frank has been innovating in the field of ketosis for several years, and he's going to share with us some of what he's learned. I'm very excited about this conversation, and I'm sure you'll learn a lot from him as well. Frank, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. No, thank you for taking the invitation. I know that you're incredibly busy. I've seen you answering people on the forums, helping them use the product, helping get people into ketosis. I don't know where you find the time to do all of this. So thank you so much for taking the time and being here as well. So I wanted to start with something a little bit more basic. I've done an episode or two on ketones and ketosis so far in the podcast. I've had a lot of interest from our listeners. But how do you define ketosis? There seems to be a lot of conflicting information out there. Right. So I define it differently than most exogenous ketone supplement companies. Exogenous ketones means that you drink ketones exogenously. And then there's the phrase endogenous ketones, which means your body makes it. But for some reason, this word ketosis is sometimes put into both categories interchangeably. It should be split apart into endogenous ketosis, meaning that your body makes ketones and putting you into the state of ketosis where you can check your blood and find that there's ketones in there but then separately, exogenous ketosis. So I actually do not define drinking an exogenous drink, whether it's a ketone salt or ketone ester and pricking your finger and suddenly there's ketones in there. I do not define that as ketosis. A lot of companies do. They say, wow, you just drank that drink. You're sitting on your butt doing nothing and you're in ketosis. And then they equate it to you're burning fat. It's just incorrect. It's misleading. It's just not right. So I define ketosis as without exogenous ketones, drinking a ketogenic diet or eating a ketogenic diet, 80% fat, 15 protein, 5% carbs, and your body is starved of carbs, and then it needs an emergency fuel. So it goes to your fat reserves, burns your fat, and it makes beta hydroxybutyrate, which is one of the three main ketones, and your body makes ketones, and then you test your blood. And if you're over 0.5 to 1.0 millimolar, you are what they say in ketosis. So that's how I define ketosis. How'd I do? I think that's great. And I do completely agree with you. I think one of the biggest hurdles, one of the biggest problems with most of the exogenous ketones is exactly that. 
that just by raising your ketones from the outside and allowing you to see it on a monitor and a device or in any way, then people suddenly think that they're burning fat and they don't understand that ketones in your blood are the result of fat that has been burnt. Yeah. And what some people don't realize is actually taking exogenous ketones will stop any fat burning that you've already accumulated, which freaks people out. It's like, oh my God, I've been in ketosis for one day or one month and this is going to stop ketones. My body making its own ketones, thinking about it. It's an emergency fuel source that your body is saying, oh my God, we need energy. And then suddenly come along and you drink the energy source. What motivation is there for the body to make more exogenous ketones? So it does temporarily stop endogenous production where your body's making it. Now, technically it can do some signaling and actually boost it so that net net in the day you have made more ketones yourself, but initially it will stop endogenous ketosis, which can sometimes freak people out because they're like, oh my God, it's kicking me out of ketosis. Exactly. And then you also ask the phrase nutritional ketosis, what that is. If you want, I can jump into it. Sure. Yeah. So there are some scientific papers that you know, these are scientists, they're not marketing people. And sometimes they don't really put much thought into a phrase that they throw out. And then recently in the last three or four years, they've used the phrase nutritional ketosis to define not nutrition like food type of ketosis, but actually drinking exogenous ketones. They define that as nutritional ketosis. So that just messes everything up because, you know, you were using the phrase nutritional ketosis, which seems logical to me, meaning nutrition, food, and then food meaning fat, protein, carbs at the right ratio, and your body's making ketones. But a couple of the literature scientists threw in the phrase nutritional ketosis and screwed it all up. Wow, I just learned something because I have been misusing that phrase then. Well, I don't know who's right. So I don't know who's misusing it. It makes more sense to me that nutritional ketosis means getting into ketosis through food. But that's not how the papers are referring to it. Oh, that's something to look out for, for sure, when we start having those ambiguous definitions. So thank you for pointing that out. Now, you also mentioned something very interesting right here, and it has to do with weight loss. A lot of the people that approach me and that are starting into the keto diet in general, they want to do it to lose weight. And a lot of people do lose weight. But you mentioned something that might sound counterintuitive, that it is by consuming exogenous ketones, and it doesn't matter if it's a salt, if it's an ester, you will temporarily halt the production of endogenous ketones, which means that your liver is no longer converting, even if temporarily is no longer converting fat into ketones. Is that accurate? No longer converting fat into ketones, but half of the ketone ester molecule, which we'll talk about later actually goes through the liver and actually kind of makes ketones. So it's kind of like a quasi MCT oil where we can go into what that is later. So let's talk about weight loss. So my wife says we cannot market this drink for weight loss until she loses weight on it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. So we don't market it as weight loss. Do people use it for weight loss? Absolutely. Do I recommend someone who's never done a ketogenic diet to go straight into ketogenic diet and ketone ester at the same time? I just think no. Maybe one day we'll have a 30-day plan and you follow these exact steps, but it is so tricky, the ketogenic diet, that if you throw in this extra variable of ketone ester, then you're suddenly like, oh, I have the flu and I feel sick and it's a ketone ester. No, that's the ketogenic diet. The ketone ester is different yet related. It's just way too complicated to go straight into the ketogenic diet. People want these shortcuts. They want these pills. Actually, there's this one company that offers a $5 for shipping, free trial to get these keto pills. All of their literature is technically correct, except for the fact that what they're administering is just so minuscule, it does nothing for helping you get into the ketogenic diet. And then that company will then bill your credit card $90 every two weeks. And I get people calling me thinking that I'm that company because they claim to have been on Shark Tank and all five Shark Tank you know, people invested. It's just not true. And they're making millions of dollars trying to trick people that want to go into the ketogenic diet and they want to take a shortcut and take these pills and stuff. I just think if you're going to do it, do it right. Do the ketogenic diet first by itself. And then you can start incorporating exogenous ketones if you wish. But you know, many people don't even need them. They're successful with the ketogenic diet. With the ketone salts, a lot of them suggest weight loss or they claim weight loss on their packages. But I've said, you know what else works for weight loss? They say ketogenic diet plus ketone salts helps you lose weight. Well, I've said ketogenic diet and clapping your hands helps you lose weight. Like it's the ketogenic diet. And there's a lot of misleading information out there. Can it be used right? 
yes, but at least for the esters, it's just so powerful and so strong. It just, I think, confuses things if you're brand new, straight, trying to get into the ketogenic diet. All you need for a ketogenic diet, as far as supplements, is salt. I'm not talking about ketone salts, just regular salt, meaning sodium, potassium, and a nighttime magnesium. Because when you start a ketogenic diet, you lose massive amounts of water weight. So much so that my wife was, again, a guinea pig, in bed, shaking, heart racing, headache, and just saying, what have you done to me? I need to go to the hospital. I called some experts. And they said, you need to give her 20 to 25 salt pills. And I gave her all this salt. Within 15 minutes, she was up and walking around. So that's what happens when your body is massively deprived of salt. So all you need is to make sure that you keep your salt levels up. And I'm not just talking about shaking a little bit of salt on your vegetables or whatnot. I'm talking about massive amounts. So either drinking salt water, which I don't like to do, or salt pills potassium pills, and then nighttime magnesium pills. Yeah, absolutely. On one of our previous episodes, I think it was episode 10, I had Dr. Jamie Seaman, and she was sharing a lot about this and the importance of consuming and increasing your salt intake while on a ketogenic diet to avoid most of the symptoms. And people think that, well, it must be bad if you're having all these disorders. I'm like, no, in reality, this is what we should be consuming anyway. We're just getting rid of all that excess that we normally had. The way that I can explain it in a layman's term is, Every molecule of glucose is attached to a molecule of water. It's kind of an exaggeration, but keeping it simple. When you deplete your body of glucose, it no longer has that water to hold on to. So it just flushes the water out of your system, which is why people love the diet because they think they're losing weight. But in the first few days, that weight is, for the most part, all water weight. But they still like their scale going down 10 pounds, which is why you know some experts will say, throw away your scale for 60 days and just no more stress because stress causes weight gain. No more stress looking at the meter, at the scale, and then this water stuff will really throw you off. But when you lose five, 10 pounds of water with it, just gets flushed out tons and tons of electrolytes. And you don't need to keep up this massive amounts of electrolytes after the first two weeks. I still do take salt pills, but initially when you start getting lightheaded or you start getting brain fog, for the most part, that is from salt deprivation. Now there is a period of time during this keto flu concept where the glucose is going down and the ketones are going up and then ketones haven't gotten high enough yet to reach the brain. So there is some use where exogenous ketones could help fill that out. But another trick that I got from Ryan Lowry is do some wind sprints. And if you do wind sprints, you'll burn up your glycogen. Sometimes, I don't know if it's 30 seconds, a minute, you'll burn up that glucose so fast that your body then needs to make the ketones faster. So get on a bike and do 30 seconds as fast as you can, or you know, run up a hill. And obviously, if you have any medical conditions, don't be going and get a time from it. That's actually a really good way to go about it, because one of the things that we see a lot with people who start adopting a ketogenic lifestyle is that they will suddenly stump at the keto flu. And sometimes we do recommend, like I have recommended exogenous ketones at that time. I completely agree with you. I don't think that somebody who's coming from a standard American diet, high in carbs, high in processed foods, and suddenly wants to start into a healthier lifestyle can just go 100% full keto diet and start taking exogenous supplements. I think it really doesn't make sense at all. But like you said, people usually want shortcuts, but we always emphasize the name of the show is the highway to health, not the shortcut to health, because we want people to realize that we can point them in the right direction, but there is still work to be done and they still need to be patient about all those things. Yeah. The benefit of those exogenous ketones, the ketone salts that you're saying to enter into a ketogenic diet, those are fine, but it's the salt content that's doing most of the benefit, not necessarily the ketone. So they might not be getting that 25 salt pill equivalent, but you know, one packet, easy enough. I just think that they can save a lot of money by buying Ultima sells a sugar-free you know, salt packet, a few different companies or salt pills, just to save some money just by going straight after a salt load. Exactly, exactly. Now, what would you say then, if we're focusing on most of the benefits of ketosis coming from what we should be doing in terms of nutritional ketosis, because it's just as important everything else that we're doing. You don't just consume an exogenous ketone product and go to McDonald's you still have to follow a lifestyle. So what are the benefits of actually utilizing exogenous ketones at a certain point? So initially, it was actually designed by Dr. Richard Beach. He's NIH, 30 years there, multiple papers. His name is the last name on the paper, which means that they're the lead on it. And he actually designed it for non-ketogenic people. 
Now, it just happens to be that keto people are more familiar with what exogenous ketones are, but the ketone ester itself was actually designed for non-ketogenic people. The ketone salts were initially invented or created by Dr. Beach, but he literally threw them in the trash because he just said, too much sodium, the doctors will get mad at me because of all the heart attacks. And just the amount of ketones that could be delivered with that amount of sodium is just so small that he just threw it in the trash. But enterprising companies said, hey, if you combine a ketogenic diet and these ketone salts, maybe you can just go from a 0.5 to a 0.8 or 0.9 and just move the meter a little bit. But the ester is so much more powerful that it can be used without a ketogenic diet. However, I hate the prospects of someone saying that, you know, I have this horrible diet, I eat high sugar, I go to McDonald's, and now somehow they're going to take the ester to erase all those things. I tell them, no, no, no. I actually talked someone out of it. They read the Amazon reviews and she contacted me and she said, oh, I was worried you might do this. I talked her out of it. She still had the problem of she was still doing sodas because she was an emergency rescue person that had strange hours at night, was doing soda, caffeine, and all these other problems. And she wanted to take the ester to kind of erase those things. I said, no, 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 no. That problem is much, much bigger than any benefit that the ester might give you. Go tackle that first. Don't necessarily go ketogenic. That's fine. Just this crazy sugar load of high glycemic sugars. Get rid of that first. I don't like the ideas of people using the ester or any exogenous ketones for cheat days where they're on a ketogenic diet for a month or two months and then they eat a bunch of carbs and then somehow they drink ketones and then their ketones are up and they're like, oh, well, now I've maintained the ketones in my blood. No, no, no. Your system had the glucose spike and the harm has been done. The esters will lower glucose, so there can be some tricks to eating it with meals, but we normally recommend it without meals. So people that are non-keto, they can take the ester. It just sometimes we find that they need to take 50% more So the people that are already keto can just take far less and they're able to find benefit. And also sometimes we find that people that are not keto, they might have to take it actually three or four times. Whereas for most people, it works the first time that they take it or first time that they get the right dose, they might increase the amount. Um, But people that are non-keto, there's something called MCT transporters, has nothing to do with MCT oil, has to do with delivering the ketones out of your blood to where they need to go, to your brain, to your muscles. People think that the high ketones in your blood is actually a good thing. It is in a sense, but the ketones don't do anything in the blood. They don't make your blood redder. They don't make it flow faster or anything. It's when it goes out of the blood and actually goes where it needs to go, where the benefit is had. So that's the MCT transporters, where it transports the ketones to where they need to go. And some people that have never been on a ketogenic diet might not have as many of those transporters. So they're not recognizing the fuel as quickly. So they need more or a few more days getting into their system. In your experience, have you noticed that these people, as they start using it, they start responding better to lower dosages? Good question. What we do know is the non-keto and kind of the keto people as well, by initially doing not the minimum dose, but by doing this 10 or 15 mLs, even though the bottle is technically 30 mLs, this bottle is technically 30. We used to call it one serving, but then people started drinking that much of it. Sometimes it's good for the non-keto people that have never experienced ketosis to take a little bit more the first time so that it's more likely for them to feel something so that when they cut back and the cut in half, they know what to look for. Because we do have occasionally people say, I didn't notice anything or it did nothing for me. The last three times someone said that they didn't notice anything. The first one said, I didn't notice anything. 15 minutes into the conversation, I found out that she took it for the first time that she's ever done a three-day fast. She took it for fasting. And she took it multiple times during the day. She's like, yeah, I didn't notice anything. Okay, well, how was your fast? Oh, it was easy. (laughs) Do you think fasting is normally easy to not eat for three days? Oh, I don't know. I've never done it before. Okay, well, that's what the ester does. She didn't think about it. She just went three days without eating. (laughs) And I was like, man, I got a tough crowd here. If (laughs) if you don't notice anything and you went three days, I'm like, you know what? Next time you do a three-day fast, don't use the ester. And then you can come back onto my podcast and we can talk about it because that's what it did. She even hit the return button. I was like, okay, here's your money back, but let's still try and figure this out. Another person didn't feel anything yet. She went to the gym and at the end of her workout, she added 20 minutes. She said, could that be the ketones? I'm like, yeah, that's what it does. It's more towards the end of the workout for more for recovery and just less being zonked at the end of the workout. And then she said, oh yeah, I thought, you know what, now's the time for me to, I think, increase all of my weights across the board, five pounds. I think I'm ready for the next level. 
could the Esther have done that? This is the first time taking it. Could the Esters have done that? It's like, it's exactly what it did. It just made them feel slightly easier. People expect a rush. We initially had niacin in there, which, you know, makes you feel it initially like two years ago, makes you feel it. And people are like, yeah, I felt it. I'm like, you know, what? that's the niacin. So we took it out. There's some benefit to niacin we can talk about later. But, you know, the ester itself, some people just won't feel it. Yet they'll be running the half marathon and then they look down at their watch and they're setting a new PR. Or recently we had a 66-year-old pharmacist who's been keto for a couple of years. He did a triathlon. And he was expecting to do 44 minutes in the water and he had no pace, no timer. And it came out and he felt fine, normal, good. And he looked down at his watch and it was 40. It was 10% faster, but he didn't feel a difference. And the reason there is in part because I like to say it lowers lactic acid, but that's not really correct. It lowers the increase in lactic acid. So what happens when you lower your lactic acid? That's what holds most athletes back. So then they just work out a little bit harder or go a little bit faster until their threshold is normal. So they feel normal and then they look at their watch and you know the numbers are different there. Exactly. And that benefit on lactic acid is one of the reasons why I recommend it for patients who want this anti-aging lifestyle. And the reason is we see patients in their late 40s, 50s, and they come in and they want to start living healthier and they want to correct everything they've been doing. And maybe they decide they want to go to the gym and they go to the gym one day and then they're sore for a whole week. And we've seen that when we combine something like this, it really helps them recover much faster because they will only have so much motivation to get started. And if they hit such a tough roadblock, like being sore for six or seven days, they're not going to go back to the gym. So that's very useful, not just for athletes, like you were saying, but I've really seen those benefits across the board. I experienced that myself when I started taking the esters compared to the salts that I had been taking before. I'm usually in mild ketosis state. I do a lot of intermittent fasting. And one thing that I noticed is that I'm very in tune. Most of the time I get hungry around 2 p.m., 1 or 2 p.m. if I skip breakfast. And when I started taking the esters, I suddenly realized that it was 4 p.m. and I was still going straight. I was a lot more focused and helped me recover much better. How much do you take? What's your protocol? I was taking about, and this was kind of like eyeballing it. I was taking about between five and seven at the very most. A fraction of a serving, that's about $3 worth. So you mentioned motivation. One of the earlier papers on the Esther, they had like a write in other comments by the participants and they said, it just made me motivated to get off the couch and go do something. So it actually does help with motivation, but it does help with recovery. However, we have had instances where one person was doing, you know, normally they did one flight of stairs of this building and they took a lot of the ester and then they did seven <laughs> and then they blew out their calves and they said, oh, but you said it was anti-inflammatory and it helps for recovery. Well, it does unless you do seven times more. And I've actually been caught in this. I love to run on my toes, five finger shoes. I love them. And I can only do a couple miles in them, but I felt so good once with the esters and I took niacin as well, which I can talk to you about. And then suddenly I was like, oh, let me just add another neighborhood. Let me just turn it here. And before you know it, I got home, felt fine. And I'd blown out a few minutes later, I figured or realized that I'd blown out my calves and I was out for seven days. So you don't want to overdo it with the esters. But some people actually will take it not even before a workout, they'll take it after the workout for the recovery benefit of it. It has an anti-inflammatory effect. And make sure you also take in some electrolytes and some water as well, because the ester has been shown to actually deplete your body a little bit of water and electrolytes. So you want to keep those in. But with longevity, there is a paper that Dr. Beach wrote on longevity, where he talks about all the different animal studies that show that a food deprivation makes them live longer. And they have all these theories around why it happens. And his conclusion was pretty much, it's the ketone, stupid. Like all the papers missed the fact that all these animals were calorically restricted and none of them mentioned the increase in ketones and ketones being a more efficient fuel source. So yes, the theory is that it will help with longevity. I would like to touch upon real quickly, people that can't necessarily go into a full ketogenic diet, then you're asking you know, the other extreme of the McDonald's person and just eating junk food with the ketone esters, which I don't advocate. But I do think that there is a possible middle ground that can work for people, which is if you can't go full keto, just cutting out the five deadly sins, which is fruit, what I call fruit, rice, bread, pasta, and then I say fruit again. And I'm not even counting candy and soda, like that's a given. 
But if you cut out the high glycemic index foods and people are like, well, what about organic fruit? Organic fruit, the blood glucose spike is the same as a Snickers bar, a non-organic Snickers bar. The organic part isn't part of the equation. So if you just cut out the high glycemic, so stopping those spikes, because those spikes are really what troubles the brain and the body and fatigue and the crashes. If you cut that out and incorporate esters, that is a transition. If you can't get the person to go full keto, that is an option that I don't know if you've considered that. The ester will work regardless if you use much higher doses, but it just gets too expensive. And you know there might be some limitations even with high doses. If you have a spike of glucose, I think it might be three steps forward, two steps back. But if you cut out the low-hanging fruit of the fast carbs and you incorporate the esters there, I think that could be more sustainable and a long-term solution. Whereas the keto diet, I've done it for three years. I'm keto vegan. And I actually made a post recently said, I wonder if I should try keto vegan paleo. <laughs> Just, and it's fine for me, but you know, for many people, they find it difficult. I actually found that that you just mentioned. That's quite interesting. So you do a vegan diet while still keeping a high fat, because that's one of the things that a lot of people don't necessarily get. Most vegan diets are very, very high carb. And more than vegetarian, these people become breadifarians and pastatarians, right? So what has been your experience so far? I in no way equate vegan with being healthy. Because you can be so unhealthy vegan. You can eat Twizzlers. Now, there is healthy vegan. And just as same with carnivore, you can eat unhealthy processed meat versus grass-fed beef and stuff. I initially got into it with a few books that I read 10 years ago. And my wife, she was doing it for animal rights reasons. And I read a book, Finding Ultra by Rich Roll, where he ran seven ultra marathons in five or seven days on the Hawaiian Islands, all on a vegan diet, high carb all on a vegan diet. And my wife today, actually, we went to a strawberry patch, so I wasn't eating any of those. Um, She had a t-shirt that said, remain calm, plants have protein. So this concept of, well, where do you get your protein from? But as far as how do I do it, I do a lot of liquid coconut oil. I don't do MCT oil that much. I actually haven't had it in a while. I don't do much MCT oil, which is the stronger version of liquid coconut oil. I just do the cheap Carrington Farms $8 $8 a pound from Amazon, do lots of avocados, and we do lots of guacamole. We'll go to our family. They're not keto, but we'll go to a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, and our entire meal is two huge things of guac, and that's it. And I'll get sliced cucumbers to dip into the guac, and they'll use chips, but the ratio has to be lots of guac, small in the chips. So we'll do lots of guac, and even in the guac, we'll add olive oil. Make sure you get quality olive oil. There's a lot of cheap olive oil out there that has fake canola oil in it and stuff. So I'll put some olive oil in the guac, but I also like to do smoothies. I'm really big into Vitamix, but I don't eat for taste. I eat for fuel. I don't like this exception day on my birthday to eat a cake. I don't want to feel like crap tonight or tomorrow. And I mean, the other day, I don't know what I ate. It was something vegan, keto. I think it might've been tofu. The entire day, my eyes were glossed over. It was as if I had contact lenses on it. I just couldn't rub it out. I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, I got to get back to healthier eating vegan because I was kind of going down some not so healthy keto stuff. But smoothies, I love Vitamix. I go to the farmer's market, get a whole bunch of different things, and then I tend to freeze them after a few days. And then I also freeze my avocados. I smush them all up, put them into ice cube tray, squeeze some lemon on top. So I have perfectly ready avocados. And I'll make these massive, thick smoothies, putting in a bunch of ginger, which cuts the bitterness of the plants, of the greens, leafy, leafy greens, kale, spinach, Swiss chard, trying to change it up, dandelion. And I'll just make this massive smoothie. And people say, oh, they'll taste it. And they say, that doesn't taste good. My goal is for it to taste not bad. If it tastes good, that means you put too much sweetener, whether it's artificial or natural. Still, you shouldn't put in too much of that stuff. So my goal is for it to taste not bad. I also put cocoa powder in there. So I try to get a smoothie in every day. Ends up being maybe three times a week. Lots of avocados every day. Lots of nuts. I go to Trader Joe's and I just go to the nut aisle, stick my arm out and just buy every single nut. For breakfast, if I want a breakfast, oftentimes I'll skip it. But if I want breakfast, I'll do a nut cereal where I take all that Trader Joe's stuff, chop it up into tiny nuts with a little slap chop 2000 thing and a lot of coconut, shredded coconut, and I'll use unsweetened coconut milk or some sort of milk, and I'll make a cereal so I have that crunching sensation. 
we're now getting into the habit of doing a constant flow of kale chips. So we just buy a whole huge bushel of kale. We have a kale chip machine or a dehydrator that goes 12 hours. And at the end, we have the super crunchy kale with oil and salt chips. And I'm not trying to lose weight. I actually lost too much weight. My wife sometimes would say, hey, you're looking a little bit sickly. So when I want to gain weight, I get a whole bunch of really expensive macadamia nuts that are roasted and salted. And I just have them within hand's reach and my weight goes up. But if for some reason I want to lose weight, I make sure that those nuts are more on the raw. Then I'm not eating for taste and flavor. I'm eating for fuel. Wow. Okay. So that's really interesting. I did a vegan diet for a couple of years. As a matter of fact, I refer to myself now as a recovering vegan, mostly because it was really, really hard. And at first I experienced a lot of health benefits so much that I started really following and reading a lot of these things, but then the benefits seemed to stop. And looking back now, I know that it was because although vegan, it was highly carb. I simply don't respond really well. Now I'm doing much better. I'm flirting with the idea of carnivore. I do kind of carnivore days and kind of just regular keto days, more paleo-like, and that seems to work very well. But I'm very interested in finding out people who are doing healthy vegan because the big, big, big tendency, especially as you see people going to veganism for ethical reasons, is that they're incredibly unhealthy. And they start becoming emaciated and they start becoming, you can see that they're simply not getting the right nutrients and people just don't get it. They think that, well, I'm vegan. I can't get cancer. I'm vegan. I can't do these things. I have a theory on carnivore, but first with the vegan, yes, there's many people that are recovering that do the two years, do the five years, and then they, it stops working for them or they start having you know, detriments. There was actually a scandal where like the top three YouTube vegan people were caught eating fish in Bali and stuff like that. I don't advocate for the vegan diet. Everyone to each his own. I do it for myself. And people say, oh, do you feel amazing? Uh, no, not necessarily. I just do it because that's my life. It works for me. But I do make sure to get the B12 and all these different things that after two years of being vegan, if you don't have these other, that you need supplements, then you can start going downhill after two years tremendously. But my theory about the carnivore diet is the reason that the carnivore diet works for a lot of people is that it cuts out processed foods and sugar. So this one person was trying to get their child more healthy. And, and she said, oh, I'm considering the carnivore diet. She told me that she was still eating or drinking sodas and candy and stuff like that. And I said, you know what? If you do the carnivore diet, that'll be much healthier than what you're doing right now, which is all that sugar. So one huge benefit of the carnivore diet is cutting out sugar and processed foods. So how much of that benefit is really, it's more about the harm of the sugar than it really is the benefit of the meat. I agree on both of those counts. I think the most important benefit that people see from most of these diets is cutting out the crap that we're eating on a day-to-day -day basis. And it doesn't matter really when you think about it, it doesn't matter what diet, if it's a formal diet, all of them emphasize cutting out most processed foods, except for like the slim fast and things like that, that they manufacture processed goods. But every other diet, they're emphasizing on quality of foods. And I think that is one of the things that is incredibly important. Now, before we wrap things up, what would be your top two or three recommendations for somebody who is interested in a ketogenic lifestyle and wants to get started? Which direction would you point them in? I would watch Keto Connect. I'm a big fan of theirs and, and start seeing what people do on a day-to-day -day basis just cleaning out your cupboards completely. Don't even have stuff nearby. There's a couple of movies. I think Miracle Pill is a good one where they just gut people's entire kitchen. I'd go down that path and just make sure that you get the salt intake when you do a ketogenic diet. And you don't need any of these supplements and stuff like that. You just need massive amounts of salt. Other tips, there is a light at the end of the rainbow. I actually have told people, you can stay non-keto, take the ester once, feel, for some people, it's just a parting of the clouds, this mental clarity, feel that mental clarity, and then put away the esters, never take the esters again, and just go do the diet. You'll be fine. Now, the ester and the diet, you've experienced that is exponentially better, but the night and day difference from a sugar world to this ketogenic diet world is just so huge. Take the esters, see the light, and then go on your way and just do the diet, and you'll be fine. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I've personally utilized the esters that your company manufactures. And I've said it before, I've actually switched from the salts that I was utilizing because despite following a mostly ketogenic lifestyle, I still 
enjoy the benefits that I get in terms of mental clarity and focus. And just like you said, it's not like the parting of the ocean. It's not like suddenly you get illuminated and things like that. It's just that once you take it and you start working, suddenly you realize that, oh my God, I've been focusing for so much longer. I've been able to nail down my list of to-dos for today. I've been able to do all these things. And I really enjoy that. That's why I've kept doing it. Well, if I could jump in real quick on the difference between ketone salt and ketone ester, I'll try to make it as fast as possible. The main molecule is called beta hydroxybutyrate. That's one of the three ketones. And it's an acidic molecule. So the solution with all these ketone salts is to take this beta hydroxybutyrate and combine it with a salt. Don't mix salt with the word sodium. Salt is sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium. So you have to Sometimes they will hide it on the label under percentage of RDA, and you don't see that it's a massive amount of total salt. So they'll attach it, but the amount of salt required to get any amount of ketones in there is massive. And most of the products, 90% of the products are only 50% bioavailable, meaning only half of it works. It has to do with something called the D and the L form, otherwise known as the R and the S form, and the word racemic, where only half of it is what the body can recognize. So then even though the other half that the body cannot recognize is an acid, it still has to have the salt load. So most of the salts that are out there are racemic. And how do you know if it's racemic? They won't say that it's racemic. So it's very difficult. Almost all of them are unless they go out of their way to say D or they say R, beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the more expensive. It costs 10 times more to make, not to sell, but to make. So the salt load that people take, the salt also inhibits. Even though you need salt initially upon getting into a ketogenic diet, you don't need four to eight grams of salt. It actually starts to inhibit and restrict the delivery of beta hydroxybutyrate. The ketone ester is that same beta hydroxybutyrate, the D form, the R form, the good form, and it's combined with something called D13-butane diol. And 1,3-butane diol is similar to MCT oil, but think of MCT oil as this being 10 times stronger because MCT oil, the C8, only 10% of it makes ketones through the liver. Whereas the D1,3 butane dial, 100% of it converts to ketones. So it's just a much more expensive process. And people think of the esters as being expensive to buy, but what they don't understand is actually less expensive on a dollar per dollar effective basis because one of these drinks might be 30 bucks and it's on ketoneaid.com. And we also have a Facebook forum where people discuss their protocols. But people are already taking before sleep three to five mLs. That's a buck or $2 worth where they would have to take an entire salt packet that might be also two or three bucks worth. So it's the same on the effective and raising your blood ketones, about the same, but much more concentrated. But also make sure to dilute it with water when you take the estrogen. This particular product, this particular salt that I was taking, and I liked it, but this particular salt added up to being close to $5 per serving. When you look at it from that point of view, and if you're using it for a specific purpose, then that really does start adding up. So it's great to understand those differences. And now you're taking $3 of ester. Exactly. And I'm getting more of a benefit because nobody should be taking it with the goal of reaching a certain level of ketosis in their blood. They should be taking it for the results and the benefits that they get. The goal shouldn't be just to see a number on a screen. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. The two years ago, we were all about look at 7.0. Exactly. And I see a lot of potential patients interested in the keto diet. They tend to think that, oh, am I going to have to be prickling my finger every so I was like, no. That's useful. That's information, but that should not be the goal. Getting a big number on a meter shouldn't be the goal. The goal is to feel better, to perform better. And that is something that I have been experiencing. And I want all of our listeners to know that that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you come on. We normally don't bring in people who manufacture any of the products that we normally talk about and things like that, because I don't want it to sound biased. But this is definitely something that I found to have a profound difference, a profound benefit in my performance. And I wanted to share it with everyone else. Have you tried it for sleep yet? That's another thing that now that you mentioned that I wanted to ask you. So if we can do that really quick and you can just touch upon that. On my Instagram, and I'm actually looking at my screen right now where I just put a collage of five of them, five people submitting their aura ring. This is you know an aura ring that makes your deep sleep. And five of them submitted, here's 25% deeper sleep, an extra 30 minutes, an extra one hour for Robbie Rowe. Ty Jensen had the 25%. Metabolic Mike shows his graph normally at 30 minutes of deep sleep, and then it popped to one hour. And another person who took a tiny amount her first time ever, and May 7th, she had six minutes of deep sleep. May 8th, she had one hour of deep sleep with the ester. And then May 9th, she did not take the ester and went back down to 10 minutes 
of deep sleep. So for some reason, the way that it works, we think, is that it increases NADPH, and then that increases the absorption of melatonin, not the melatonin that you take, but just your natural body. And you know, people were recording and clocking much more deep sleep. So that's my favorite way of taking it. I take it pre-workout, and I don't work out as much as I should, and before bed. Those are my main uh, ways of taking it. That sounds like a challenge. What I'm going to do is we've got a couple of weeks between today and the day that the episode airs. So I'm going to be tracking with my aura ring. I'm going to start taking it at night. I already took it this morning. So I'll start tomorrow taking it at night. No, no, you can take it tonight as well. You can definitely take it twice a day. Some people take it four times a day. Yeah. There we go. So I've got my aura readings for the last couple of weeks and we'll be able to compare. That's going to be fun. I'll put it in the show notes. It's not a half an hour before bed. Some people make a mistake to take it half an hour before bed. It doesn't help you go to sleep. Exactly. It's more helps you have a deep sleep once you're there. So I try to keep it by my nightstand. I start with four or five mLs the first night. You can go to seven and you can go to 10 if you want. If you take too much, it makes it, for me, a shallower sleep. But some people, Travis Christopherson, he swears by, he wrote Tripping Over the Truth, Metabolic Guide to Cancer. And he says he hits 15 mLs and he sleeps like a deep baby every single day, multiple days after each other. But I take five mLs, but you can take as much as 10. And some people find benefit as low as two mLs, which is like a dollar's worth. Perfect. Well, thank you very much again for taking the time and talking to us. Everyone, I'll make sure to include the links to everything that we've discussed so far in the show notes. I'll put in my results from the Aura Rank from the last couple of days and any additional information that you might need. I'm going to point to Frank's Facebook group where you can share with other people who are also doing this. And really, the most important thing is to continue learning about this and to do you. You just heard us talk about it. Frank does a vegan diet. I do a regular keto most paleo, almost carnivore at times diet. And it is all about finding what works for you. So feel free to start experimenting, you know, within normal and common sense variables, bringing your doctor into the mix and consult the differences. There is no one exact formula. So Frank, thank you again so much for being here. Any parting words? Nope. That's it. I think we covered it all. So there you have it. This has been episode 16 with Frank Yosa. If you enjoyed the episode and would like to learn more, remember to join us on our free Facebook group where you can find links to every other episode, the complete show notes, and you can also interact directly with me and with other health-minded individuals on the road to better health. Just go to dre.show forward slash group and click on the appropriate button. Thank you all once again for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you here next week. And remember, you're on the highway to health and I'm your guide to get you there. Thank you for listening to Dr. E's Highway to Health show, helping you learn the science of living ageless. Did you enjoy the show? Please like, share, and subscribe where you listen to podcasts. Dr. E wants to hear from you. Go to dre.show. Again, that's dre.show. Until next time, this is Dr. E's Highway to Health, helping you live ageless.